Hey everybody, it's Professor Keegan, and I'm here with another video lecture. Uh, this is for our Tuesday class this week. Uh, I believe that's April 7th, and we're coming close to the end of the semester, so we're really just pushing through um, this section of the syllabus, and then we'll be into our unit on utopias. Um, so before I get started discussing Sarah Ahmed's uh, article orientations, I wanted to just push a quick reminder to you which is that I did email you all a detailed kind of outline of our next three weeks of the class um, with some changes and, and emendations about how we're going to approach, um, you know, assignments, getting things turned in, stuff like that. So if you have not yet checked announcements on Blackboard or your email, you should do that and review those changes and plans so that any issues you might have with completing work or being able to meet deadlines can be worked out in advance. So please do do that as part of your routine checking in um, on all of your kind of like components of the course. Um, that's really the only reminder I have today, but you know, it's just go over there and look at all the other reminders. So sorry about that. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I'm just gonna get directly into our content for today. Um, and this is, we're continuing our unit on um, affects and phenomenologies. Last week we looked at um, the matrix and we looked at um, Jack Halberstam's article, or I guess it's a book chapter, Queer Temporality and Postmodern Geographies. And this week we're um, extending our discussion of temporality and phenomenology by adding spatiality or the question of directionality and orientation in space to that conversation. Um, so we're looking at Sarah Ahmed's uh, piece, Orientations, and then uh, this image is actually a still from the film we'll be watching on Thursday, which is another film by the same directors who made The Matrix, The Wachowski Sisters. It's their first film, and it's called Bound. Um, so uh, toward the end of this lecture, I'll ask some questions for you to get you prepped up for viewing that film on Blackboard. Um, so to get started, who is Sarah Ahmed? Um, she is actually an independent scholar uh, who's written a lot of different books, um, uh, including the one uh, where the book that we're looking at, uh, this piece comes from a book called Queer Phenomenology that she wrote in 2006. Um, she's written a lot of books on feminist and queer theory, post-colonialism, post critical race theory, um, and she used to uh, work at Goldsmiths uh, in London, but uh, actually resigned her post over a sexual assault case. Um, that she felt the university wasn't taking action on. So now she's just writing books and being awesome. Um, oh, and yes, uh, this article that we looked at is an, actually an early version of a chapter that appears in her, in her book, Queer Phenomenology. Um, so uh, this piece is called Orientations, and it's part of this larger work in which Ahmed um, applies queer theory to the field of phen phenomenology, which I talked about last week, or uh, the study of perceivable things and events, um, by theorizing how race and sexuality are spatialized in culture. So I mentioned um, in that last lecture that, you know, time and space are kind of this vector at which we experience embodiment and perception. So we can't have time um, I guess time could be this vector without a spatial plane in which that time is taking place. So we would be wrong to only think about temporality without thinking about spatiality as well or geography. So that's what we're doing uh, in this week of the class. So Ahmed's considering how space is sexualized and gendered as well as raced. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit less time with her theories of race and more with sexuality and gender. Uh, but you could certainly take a look at her chapters on, um, you know, orientation and the orient to think about how space is also, space also has these racialized aspects to it. Um, so Ahmed is using this word orientations to point to how sexual orientation itself, right, is, you know, speaking to how bodies are relating to space in normative and non-normative ways. So how queer bodies are actually made queer or rendered queer by the way that those bodies take up space and um, are positioned within space and time, those, those temporal and spatial fields. Um, Ahmed shows how queer bodies do not follow the straight line or the accepted path in culture. 
And she, she says, therefore, because queer bodies don't make the same kinds of motions or move along the same pathways that are set up for most people, that we then appear askew or out of line or offline, right? Queer bodies are ones that deviate. You know, to deviate is to move off of, right, uh, a pathway. Um, and so she's thinking about how all this terminology around sexuality has these like deeply spatialized uh, assumptions built into it. And then later in the piece, she starts to explore how cultural institutions, particularly the family, um, have the power to act as what she calls straightening devices to restrict our movement or where our bodies can go or what kinds of objects we can come into contact with. So, you know, if the queer, the queer body starts to maybe kind of desire to move off that path, there's a force that will come and, and try to push that queer body back into line. Um, and so Ahmed says, you know, we're all under this pressure of straightening all the time. And straightening is about trying to work out and simplify and make linear these connections um, along this straight path that we're supposed to be following. So just to remember from last week, phenomenology is the study of how we know things happen, right? How can we say when something has taken place? What kinds of sensory inputs do we need to have said that is a thing that took place um, and there's a discrete event that has taken place with a cause and effect pattern? And we can say, we can observe the cause and the effect and see that they're related. Uh, but it's also about how we as can assign discrete what we might call thingness to certain objects of perception. Um, like the example of like, why, how, why are a table and a stool different objects, right? There is an agreed upon consensus that um, a stool has a certain utility that a table does not, and that different components of these objects have to be present for something to be one and not another. So a stool will generally have three legs and a table four, right? So we look for the number of legs to make that distinction. We also might think uh, something is a stool if it's placed in a certain space versus a table. Um, so contextualization there is also important in terms of where and when we're encountering an, an object. Um, so for example, we could ask some, there's a cat behind me, by the way, that's Daphne climbing around. <laughs> um, we could ask, you know, what makes something recognizable as straight versus queer? Um, how many people need to kind of become concerned about you or get signals from you or how many people's gaydar needs to go off before you start to actually acquire a perceivably queer presence or you start being thought of as a queer or trans body right um or you know what sorts of qualities even need to be present for someone to be uh categorized into one gender category or the other these are kind of deep questions that phenomenology can help us think a little bit more carefully about so in this uh, piece, on page 67, Ahmed writes, phenomenology helps us to consider how sexuality involves ways of inhabiting and being inhabited by space. And that's her main concern here. And she's using this word orientation to think about how sexuality is about being drawn to or wanting to move into or towards certain objects and spaces. So space and sex and gender, why are they connected? Um, we could think about how a lot of the terms we use to discuss sex and gender are knowable as things through a spatialized relationship to cultural systems and structures. So, for example, um, Ahmed does quite a bit of work in this piece talking about why straightness is called straightness. It's because people who are straight move kind of unproblematically and smoothly along these pre-established pathways and culture. Um, you know, the, the cycle of you know, birth, puberty, adolescence, you know, marriage, reproduction, death, um, that we talked about last class with Halberstam is also, you could see it as a circle that repeats, but we could also see it as a straight line where, where the chain of events that's supposed to take place is laid out in front of you in a very clear way. And Ahmed would say, you know, it's about being oriented toward those things. And so when we start to become oriented away or toward other possibilities, we start to bend off that straight line, right? We start to move laterally rather than straight at the goal. 
uh, the goal being heterosexual reproduction, um, and then the replication of straightness with new children who will do the same thing. So straightness is called straightness for a reason, um, whereas queer actually comes from an Indo-European root that means to bend or to be bent or twist. So queer literally means opposite spatially of straight, right? It means to deviate or move off of that line. Even the word perverse. Perverse, remember um, queer people were for a long time accused of being perverts, right? The word perverse literally means like to cross across a line. So um, these are all presumptions that are built into these terms. Bi, right? How is bi a word that is that is signaling like a two-ness um, where it's it's kind of like signaling that gender has a structure to it already in place and that then this sexuality has this kind of two structured um, sort of like desire right this this double-ended desire because masculinity and femininity and maleness and femaleness are understood as opposites so how is bisexuality structured in response to that to that kind of spatialization of gender um, cis actually means in uh, chemistry to stay on the same side. So we think of cis people as people who also uh, do not move across that binary gender formation, right? They, they stay where they were placed. They don't move. And trans means to, to go across, right? So again, um, all of these things have a spatial implication to them that are about movement, motion, and structure. We can even think about the way that maleness and femaleness are commonly icon iconographically referenced in Western culture with these image, these symbols, uh, female with the cross below it and male with the arrow, right? Now, some people say this is a representation of the, of like the mirror and the comb and then the shield and spear, right? Tools that are highly gendered. Um, you could also say that these just represent assumptions about an anatomy and anatomical structure uh, of maleness and femaleness, right? Where um, the male body is phallic and the, the feminine body it, uh, isn't, right? Um, so thinking about how everything that, all the words that we use for sexuality and gender have these like, embedded spatialized um, meanings to them that then line up or don't line up with dominant cultural constructions of say uh, how institutions are organized or how um, the law is structured right these are things that Ahmed is trying to activate for us so she says uh, in this piece that sexual and gendered orientations are the products of repeated bodily actions in space and um, this puts Ahmed in conversation with Foucault's later work in uh, a book called Discipline and Punish, where he talks about how we are all trained to know how to move our bodies. And we're, we're aware that we're always being surveilled and watched. And we're, we're aware that we're all, the way our body moves is always being policed. So we learn to move in certain ways to avoid negative outcomes. Um, Foucault looks at this specifically with the problem of criminality and how uh, the law teaches us all to move as if we are not, we do not have a criminal intent. Um, and this is far more successful for white people than black people because if you have black skin, no matter what you do, you're already kind of structured as uh, criminalized. Ahmed is talking about how this is done in terms of gender and sexuality, where we learn how what we're supposed to like and what we're what we're not supposed to like and how what we're supposed to move toward and what we're supposed to move away from um based on this idea of staying on a straight line so we learn to move our bodies and and reach for things reach out to engage things that affirm straightness and not queerness so she says that a straight body pursues direct linear connections with other bodies along established lines of reproduction, inheritance, and moral law, meaning we know who we're supposed to be attracted to. Uh, we know that we're supposed to get married and have children, and there are certain bodies that, we're, that, are going, that promise that future, and there are others that do not. 
Um, and there are there are types of sexuality, thinking back to Reuben in the charmed circle, there are types of sexuality that are going to lead to a future um, and other types of sexualities that are that are are stigmatized as being dead ends, right? Um, and so straight straight bodies can stay on that direct linear pathway and not get drawn offline. So straight and cis bodies are in line with social expectations and can extend into space to contact other bodies and objects. So she says there's like a field of objects laid before us that we are um, encouraged to engage with, whether this is other people's bodies, media texts, um, you know, uh, to certain kinds of toys, certain gendered objects like, you know, G.I. Joes or Barbies, right? This field of objects, this horizon of things we're allowed to contact um, encourages us to follow that straight pathway. However, a queer body, she says, will turn away from the embedded direction of desire and seek objects that are offline. So this, you might remember, like, as a kid wanting to maybe watch a movie that had queer content, right, and being told no. Um, or you might have been watching something and have your parents turn it off real quick or, or hold up something to block your view, right? All the ways in which uh, queer content or queer experience is edited out so that we don't fall off that line or we don't start desiring different kinds of objects that have been prevented from coming into our perception. They're out there, but we are we are um, prevented from seeing them or reaching out to them. So as I mentioned, queer comes from an etymological root meaning twisted or oblique, the kind of desire that would move us off of that line toward these other objects that are not permitted to be within the field of desire. Um, we could say a trans identity is assumed to cross or move across lines established by gender norms. And um, cisgender or not transgender means on the same side as or closer to, right? So cis people are people who stay closer to their assigned gender and do not move across this kind of dividing line between maleness and femaleness. Now, none of us knows exactly where that dividing line is. Um, we can't really phenomenologically say, like, what is the tipping point where someone ceases to be one gender and begins to be another. Um, and one of the reasons why we can't really say that is because so few of us ever actually make that leap that we don't have a cultural language for talking about like, what is the moment, right? We don't. Um, it's still, you sort of kind of find yourself on the other side one day. It just takes a certain number of people saying like, that's a woman or that's a man. And then suddenly you are on the other side. It's, uh, so phenomenologically, gender is really, really odd in the way that it functions. So these are spatial relations and how Ahmet's thinking through, you know, the orientation aspect of both sexuality and desire, but also the types of gendered practices that we find ourselves wanting to engage in. So if we think about how space um, and straightness are organized, we could think about the structural kinds of and almost geometric kinds of thinking that straightness engages in. So this is an image of, I think, four to five generations in one family, all of the white men in that family. And we could think about how this photo communicates certain assumptions about straightness, about patrilineage, about patriarchy, um, about replication of identity, about replication of, like a cis replication of gender across time, and um, about belonging and staying in line so that your generation becomes a repetition of the one before. Um, we could also think about things like family trees. This is actually uh, the, I think, the family tree of George Washington um, and how uh, biological inheritance, heterosexual inheritance, is structured to look very linear. We think about lineage, right? as inheritance, as like a, dis, a, a descent, a linear descent, right? Where, where men are prioritized above women and, and patriarchal inheritance is organized like this or like this. This is um, actually Charles Darwin's uh, family over on the left. Um, so the way in which we plot like lifespan and the way in which we think about how people come into and leave the world um, is very straight looking, right? Um, 
where does a queer person get mapped on a map like this? Especially if they don't get married, don't have children, do they just become like a dead line that never goes anywhere? Does that mean that they didn't have a life? Does that mean that they're lost to history? Um, these are questions. What if someone is born with a name uh, that they then stop using or a gender that they stop uh, practicing actively, right? Um, what happens to that person? How do we even remember who they were? These are some things that Ahmed's piece is starting to try to get us to think about. There's also this uh, image. She evokes the table, um, a phenomenological object that helps organize family. Now, a table is a common, it's commonly discussed in phenomenology as a key object on which we write and construct theory. But it's also an object that can tell us a lot about the structure of family. So who sits at the head of the table? Who sits at the foot of the table? Um, you know, we can tell from what's on the plates what class position this family might have. Um, we can tell by who sits closer to the mother or father, maybe who is more prioritized in terms of inheritance, like who's the first son versus the youngest daughter. Um, if you grew up sitting around a table for organized family meals like this, you're more than likely middle class. Um, so simply by looking at the table as a kind of organizing technology, we can start thinking about how family is structured in terms of gender, power, um, and desire. Ahmed also writes about the process of becoming straight. Um, she says basically that like all identities are processes of becoming. It's not just that like, you pop out as a straight person. Um, you have to actively make choices to stay on that straight line to like maintain straightness as a practice. Um, so she writes, in being straight, for example, one's desire follows a straight line, which is presumed to lead toward the other sex, as if that is the point of the line, like an arrow, right? You can think about Cupid's arrow as a pointed line that leads to the opposite sex. The queer orientation might not simply be directed toward the same sex, but it would, but would be seen as not following the straight line. The same sex orientation thus deviates right, or is off course. By following this orientation, we leave the usual way or normal course. Conversely, heterosexual desire is understood as online, as not only straight, but also as right and normal, while other lines are drawn as simply not following this line, and hence as being offline in the very direction of their desire. The normalization of heterosexuality as an orientation toward the other sex can be described in terms of the requirement to follow a straight line, whereby straightness gets attached to other values including decent, conventional, direct, and honest. The naturalization of heterosexuality involves the presumption that there is a straight line that leads each sex toward the other. Right. So again, we can see how she's describing um, the direction of desire. The desire has a directionality and some directions in our culture are more encouraged and privileged than other directions. Right, as she says at the very bottom here, <clears throat> the line of desire that straight people are supposed to follow is in line with one's sex also. So it's a line of desire that because you're assigned it to a sex category, you're supposed to follow. Men are supposed to be directed toward women and women toward men. Elsewhere, right, she points out that all orientations work this way. They require the work of construction. So she, I think she would agree with, with uh, Judith Butler in that regard, uh, including the work of becoming and maintaining straightness. And this is true even if orientations feel innate, right? To be recognized as real, a real straight person or a real gay person, we still need uh, social buy-in. We still need other people to see us as straight or gay. And so this is where the question of phenomenological consensus comes in, right? We're like, how gay do you have to be in order to, to get queer cred, right? Like, I think a lot of bi people and pan people actually kind of worry about not being recognized as queer because their desire doesn't stay as offline as is necessary to be consistently perceivable as, as queer. Um, it's also, you know, for, I think, uh, for, for say, bi men, um, they need to be really offline to not, or I mean, all they need is, I'm sorry, all they need is to do like one little thing offline and suddenly you're queer automatically, right? So we could think about how 
these these spatial problems are are about you know they can be about staying online but they could also be about not being off enough to be perceivable as a consistent phenomenological object Ahmed also discusses straightening devices, which I mentioned earlier, as social forces and forms of recognition that seek to push us back on to line. And she contemplates how the pull of queerness becomes enough to resist the force of these other forces. So she's curious, like, if you live in a world where there's no representation of queerness anywhere and there are no queer objects available to you to reach out for, how then do you start to realize or practice a queer way of moving, right? Like, this is one of the great kind of conundrums of queer and trans identities is like, if nothing is there to tell you that queerness can be a thing, then how does it ever become a thing, right? Does it come out of nowhere? Um, it's a really kind of deeply existential question. Um, so given the straight structure of the social and symbolic world, how do we find ways to come into contact queerly? Queer culture has been about finding ways to move offline and stay offline as a group. And when we start to get pushed back online, right, through things like marriage equality, stuff like that, then we often have to have a cultural conversation about like, what is happening to queerness? Is it getting pushed back into a straight line or is there a new straight line forming for queer people? So Ahmed is really, invested in reading queerness as a kind of offline practice, and she means offline like skewed, slanted, diagonal to, twisted, bent off of, right? She writes, so queer or inverted desires are off the track of normal development, where one uses sex for different points by not following what is taken to be the point of sexual readiness, right? So already, you know, queer and trans identities are understood to be behind normal development, right? In Freudian theory, everybody kind of goes through a queer phase, but is supposed to move out of it toward heterosexual identification. And so in Freud's theory, queer people would be delayed. Remember, Marlon calls Dory a delay fish, <laughs> right? We would be delayed or be we would be off the track of the normal timeline, which is also linear, moving through space on, at a certain rate that straight or cis people would be following. She writes, to go offline is to turn toward one's own sex and away from the other sex. To turn away from the other sex is also to leave the straight line. And yet turning toward one's sex is read as the act of threatening to put one's sex into question. So here she's talking about how early sexologists thought if you were attracted to the same sex, that must mean you were you were secretly the other the opposite sex inside right so they were saying well you must have a if you de if you're assigned female but you desire women you must have a male soul right um, or you must have a male brain uh, that was how people were understanding um, queer attraction she says this metaphor of turning away suggests that queer desire becomes a form of derailment of making the wrong turn Right? So we, we just went around that corner into, and, and like then we, we became um, unrecuperable. We could not be brought back online once we've gone too far. Right? So taking it too far right, is another kind of example of this idea of moving too far offline. Um, one more concept here that Ahmed discusses that I think is really useful is her idea of the deadly gift of straightness. Uh, she writes, we saw in Freud's narrative how heterosexuality can function as the most intimate and deadly of parental gifts. Um, so remember, when you're born, everybody is born as an ostensibly straight and cisgender person. Like, no, no one culturally assumes they're going to have a queer or trans child. So children are automatically structured as potential straight people. Um, and, you know, that's supposed to be how we develop. And so Ahmed says this is a problem because um, this gift of heterosexuality, we're born and given this like light, this cultural model that we're supposed to follow that our parents think of as a gift to us. Um, is suppo we're supposed to be really appreciative that we've been given this gift and, and we're supposed to give it back to them. We're supposed to model back straightness to our parents. So she says the gift when given demands that we, ret we return um, the favor by becoming straight people. So we give, we 
return the favor of being born with our, you know, our creation by becoming straight and reflecting our parents back to themselves. Um, <clears throat> she says, the failure of return extends the investment, which means that if you think about it, like you're in school, you're working really hard, uh, you're, you're investing a super uh, high amount of work and money in your education. And so because you're investing so much, the pay, you expect the payoff to be a lot higher, right? So, and the longer you go without getting that payoff, the more you'll invest to get the thing, right? So it's exactly not getting the return that makes you work even harder at making the thing happen. Um, so you could think about how this also applies to families where queer children uh, fail to return the gift of heterosexuality and so the parents crack down and crack down and crack down and, 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 be, and desire that gift even more, that return on the investment even more than they did before. It becomes a really fraught and necessary performance precisely because the child is incapable of returning that gift. So she writes, the failure of return extends the investment. The gift, when given, produces the one who has received the gift as indebted and demands its endless return. Heterosexuality is imagined as the future of the child insofar as heterosexuality is idealized as a social gift and even as the gift of life itself. The gift becomes an inheritance, what is already given or even pre-given. Heterosexuality becomes a social as well as familial inheritance through the endless requirement that the child repay the debt of life with its life. The child who refuses the gift thus becomes seen as a bad debt, as being ungrateful as the origin of bad feeling. You know, every time I read this paragraph, it just takes me back to the experience of being a queer child and what it's what it's like to know that you can't do the thing everyone wants you to do and feeling like because you can't, you've failed them somehow. You've, you've failed to give back the thing they gave you, even though you never asked for it to begin with. I'm going to stop my camera because my camera has frozen. Hang on. Okay, so I'm still talking. All right, so that is the ungre- oh, oh wait, we're going to go to, okay, so that's the deadly gift of straightness. Um, and we're going to go to next another key idea, which is the ungrievable loss of queerness. So if heterosexuality is a deadly gift, um, then we also, because we're structured as having to be straight, we are never, those of us who are straight or are able to stay online are never allowed to consider what we've lost by not becoming queer. Right? Queerness is, is always structured as a loss, um, and straightness is always structured as a benefit. But what if straightness was a loss and queerness was a benefit? Right. So Ahmed writes, compulsory heterosexuality produces a field of heterosexual objects by the very requirement that the subject give up the possibility of other love objects. So she's saying that straightness can only work by refute by like making sure that people cannot or give up the possibility of experimenting or being queer. She says, I think Judith Butler is right to suggest that heteronormativity demands that the loss of queer love must not be grieved. Such loss might not even be admitted as loss as the possibility of such love is out of reach. Queer objects are not close enough to the family line in order to be seen as objects to be lost. The body acts upon what is nearby or at hand and then gets shaped by its directions towards such objects, which keeps other objects beyond the bodily horizon of the straight subject. This is so key. Queer love must not be grieved. The loss of queer love must not be grieved. Such loss might not even be admitted as loss. Um, the failure to actually become queer might, also, might be a deeply... Uh, deeply um, wounding loss for many people. There are a lot of people who might be happier as queer people than straight people, but our culture is not capable of actually 
conceptualizing that, that issue. So that's the ungrievable loss of queerness. You cannot grieve that you did not become queer. You can only grieve that you did not become straight or cis. Um, and then lastly, interpolation as a straightening device. So we've talked about in, when we read Disidentifications, we talked about interpolation where Munoz says, queers are people who have failed to turn around to the hey you there of straightness, right? Where remember interpolation is where power goes, hey you, and you turn around because you feel yourself being what we would call hailed uh, by the system. Uh, and Munoz says, Straight queer people are people who simply don't hear straightness um, saying, hey, you, uh, we fail to hear it as being about us. So we don't turn around and therefore we are turned around the wrong way. Right. I think Ahmed would say that's also about space. But we could think about how these kinds of interpolation or straightening devices work in everyday life. Right. How are these attempts to push queer and trans bodies back into line um, via a normative space and time. So there are all kinds of things that people say to queer and trans people that are really about trying to push us back into line and straighten us out, uh, about like re rereading us in a more normative and linear fashion. So there's like, which one is the man or woman? As if there always needs to be a man and woman, this, this binary structure. Um, or it's just a phase, meaning you will move along and become a, t a straight person and you're just passing through this like temporary landscape where you're making uh, incorrect choices and that it will pass and you will move along into a better phase of development, right? Um, they're just friends or roommates, right? How this is like a misrecognition again of um, same-sex coupling, right? misreading people as having a different kind of relationship to one another. Um, are you sisters or brothers, right? Trying to impose a biologically and sort of like familial relationship on people rather than seeing the obvious queerness right in front of us. Or there's he, she, they, is our really a man or woman, right? Like refusing trans people's identities because that the transition from one category of gender to the other for, for, from a cis mindset cannot, can never actually take place. And so um, insisting that someone is really the thing that they started out as, or we thought they did start out as, right, is another kind of phenomenological disagreement that we see um, coming up around queer and trans identities. Um, so for next class, I'm going to have you watch this film, also directed by the Wachowski sisters. It's called Bound, uh, released in 1996. Um, it's loaded into Blackboard, and my first um, reminder here is to be careful about who you watch this film around, because it is sexy. <laughs> and so if you are worried about representations of queer sexuality, um, you know, just be careful who you're watching it around. If you've got kids in the house or if you've got um, unsupportive um, family members um, or you're doing anything around sensitive people, right? Um, just be careful about that. Um, a few notes about how to watch this movie. In, remember, we're watching films in order to kind of see theory and action. And so I would ask you to think about how Ahmed's ideas in this piece could maybe be applied to the film or how the film might help us better understand these concepts. So I'd like you to think about things like how does this film help us conceptualize sexuality and gender in relation to space, but also in relation to like visual perception. This film has a lot in it about what people think they see and then what's really actually going on. So there are all these instances of like misrecognition or misreading things. And how could that be about like um queer people like operating within straightness without being perceived without being perceived as as too offline right um so just be thinking about space and visuality here and how how do we know a thing is one thing or another secondarily there's the question of which bodies have the freedom to move within the spaces in the film to touch objects to touch each other um, this is also really important to think about from a phenomenological perspective. And then also like, what is keeping people from moving or touching? Um, what power structures are present there? What horizon of objects is available to each character? Um, 
and why are those structures happening? And then also thinking about the title as a kind of reference to space or objects touching, right? This idea of bound. What is bound here? What is binding people? Are people bound to each other? Are people bound to the spaces they're in? Um, be thinking about this, the meaning of that title. Um, how does the film alert us to the differences between appearance and reality, sight and feeling? I, I mentioned that before, but there's what we see and what we feel. And for queer people, um, how we appear and how we feel on the inside are not necessarily the same thing. Um, and so how is our exterior and maybe our interior out of alignment in some ways that might also um, be kind of related to what Ahmed's pointing out here about being offline. And then looking in the film for straightening devices. Uh, do we see queerness being offline? Do we see people trying to push it back in line? Um, do we see uh, also the failure of return on that deadly gift of straightness, right? Where like queer people are perceived as owing straight people things that they're failing to give back. Uh, <clears throat> all of that is really key to Ahmed's analysis here. And I think you'll also find some, some um, fruitful connections in Bound. Um, so I will put a post up about Bound for the next discussion entry group, uh, and, and it'll be due Wednesday evening at 7 as usual. I hope you enjoy the film, and I will talk to you uh, soon. See you on Blackboard.